to you our speaker for today, Bob Seiner. Bob is the president and principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and the publisher of the data administration newsletter, tdan.com. Bob has been a recipient of the Damon Professional Award for significant and demonstrable contributions to the data management industry. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and data, data management solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to Bob to introduce the webinar and today's panelists. Welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. It's always a pleasure working with you. Thank you very much for taking time out of your schedules to, uh, to attend this session. Session's kind of a, a change up for us, a little bit different than a lot of the webinar sessions that we've done in the past. In the past, it's been primarily or, or actually solely me speaking during the um, the webinar session. But this time, as uh, Shannon had mentioned, I have an esteemed set of panelists, people that I have uh, close relationships with as far as their involvement in the data governance industry. It's it's kind of a vast kind of a different type of group, but uh, I think that they will. Um, be able to provide you with a lot of information and, and actually compare the way that they've developed their solutions for data governance. And so in order to get started, what I'd like to do is just talk real briefly here about the upcoming webinars in June on the 19th, which is actually a special Wednesday date for this event. Um, as you know, it's the third Thursday of the month at 2 o'clock. Well, we're going to do the third Wednesday of that month because um, that will coincide with the Data Governance and Information Quality Conference, that a data diversity event and a DevTech International event um, that will be taking place in San Diego. So what we're going to do, I'll be speaking on that Thursday. So that Wednesday, what we're going to do is we're going to pull some of the thought leaders from the event into a webinar. And again, that will be a little bit different as well. But it's good to get a, a wide perspective from different individuals. The one in general will be governance for master data. And to get more information about any and all of these things, you can go to dataversity.net and look for the conference or look for uh, for the winners and uh, everything that's out there for you. Just quickly, I usually do in the uh, introductions to the webinars, I kind of go through the abstracts that I used to hopefully um, attract your attention to this event. And so we know that uh, governance programs, there's really no no two that are exactly like everyone has nuances in the things that I talk about in the abstract, um, but it's extremely beneficial to hear from people who are doing it and, and let them share their uh, experiences with you. So that's going to be the focus of this month's webinar. Um, this webinar, I selected, as I mentioned, three participants that I think will provide some great insight to you in the uh, in the questions that I've put together for them. And the you know, idea here is hopefully that you'll have questions for them, or you'll have questions for me to give to them, or um, they'll have questions for each other. And I'd like to make this kind of a lead discussion in the next hour. So what we're going to do is introduce the panelists, then we're going to talk about topic one, which if you'll notice, the three topics that I selected are very closely related to the Real World Data Governance webinars. The one that I just gave was on data storage. The one before that was on metadata and data governance, and the one that will be in July will be about master data. So I wanted to kind of touch on some of these subjects early on, and then we're going to summarize the stuff that we've talked about and uh, proceed with the Q&A. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is introduce to you the panelists. Um, I want to read everything that's on their slide, but I will um, give you the opportunity to look through that so you understand who they are. Um, I want to relate my relationship um, with them. Dan and I work together at PNC, uh, PNC Bank here in Pittsburgh, which is my hometown. And Dan has been a practitioner of data governance for years. He actually spoke at the Enterprise Data World um, at Enterprise Data World Conference last week or two weeks ago. And um, Dan is, is doing real well in the data governance uh, world. I think that he'll provide some great insight to you. The second one is Pablo Ribaldi. Pablo and I have been friends for many, many years. Pablo works for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Pablo was just the winner of the 2013 Data Governance Best Practice Award, of which I was uh, participating in the judging of that. So when I go way back, he's got a lot of history in uh, in data governance and information governance as well. And panelists, you all know her, you all love her. My friend uh, for a long time is Gwen Thomas of the Data Governance Institute. But, but Gwen actually has a change that she's made in her career. I'm not sure if you're aware of that yet. And she told me what the title was that she was going to be 
holding at uh, at her new organization. But Gwen, could you give the title and the name of the organization real quickly, just to bring people up to date as to where you are? Certainly. I've been in house, and I'm working with the Inter International Finance Corporation (IFC), part of the World Bank Group. I'm a senior operations officer, uh, working the uh, information quality and governance group. So I'm really excited about that. I have um, have had a friendship for many years. We used to work for the same consulting company together. We started talking about data governance together, you know, many years before it even became a regular uh, known topic. I've accepted Gwen because she's a practitioner now. She has a lot of insight into what different organizations have done. And I think she'll bring a, a different perspective from Pablo and from Dan. So with that, what I'd like to do is proceed. I'm a little bit orderly here in the way that I put things together. I'm going to throw the question out there and then go in the order that's displayed on the slide. So first, with the first question, we're going to go to Dan first. Dan, please spend five minutes or so answering it, and then we're going to go to Gwen, and then to Paolo, and then we'll bring it around to discussion and then move on to the next question. So, Dan, I know from working with you that um, there's a, always an adventure within your organization, and a lot of organizations have different approach in how they either identify or assign or recognize people as data stewards. So with PN Bank, a large financial organization, can you share with us how you went about doing that? Sure. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. It, it's been an adventure um, over the live years since uh, we started our work with you. Um, and that has to do with what uh, probably everybody on the call is experiencing, is that this is still a relatively new space, this uh, concept of uh, data governance, data stewardship, etc. So when you're reaching out to people in your organization whose calendars are already full and uh, blessing them with a, a new additional title and uh, asking them to come to meetings and you know uh, interact with a glossary tool or whatever, um, get a lot of uh, frightened looks, uh, scared looks, uh, you know, why me kind of things. Um, so the important thing that, that I've found over the years in, in getting the, those right you know, the subject matter experts engaged uh, properly is um, you have to have a solid foundation um, in data governance program. And specifically, um, your, your uh, you know, a central piece of our governance program is in this glossary. And so to have a good taxonomy for the glossary, that, that's off with what is the scope of your program? Are you just applying this? So one of the portfolios that you manage in your company is it enterprise? Are you trying to cover all the, the portfolios, and from there um, identify what the data domains uh, are that you want to govern? Are you going to govern, you know, customer data? Are you going to govern product data? Are you going to go, uh, govern risk data? Whatever you have. We have that established taxonomy and buy-in from the uh, executives that that's the content, um, that at least with a high priority that it needs to be governed this year or in the next three years. Um, once the data domain is established, that gives the beginnings of you know the ability to then reach out to the subject matter experts in those fields, um, and you want to go to them with very uh, tactical requests. You don't want to walk in with some high-level sort of you know uh, description of a steward that says you know you're going to steward data, you're going to be responsible for it. You give them real nuts and bolts. You get back to your desk. Here's what is being asked of you. Uh, we're asking you to go to business glossary application or, or go to these, you know, data sets and help us um, identify what the, uh, what the high priority terms are to be defined or whatever. Um, so and in short, it, it starts with a, a good, um, well-defined taxonomy, um, a very clear purpose for your data governance program, exactly what you're going to be asking them for uh, in the way of time and um, in action, uh, again, with your government's tools and your processes and things like that. Um, and with those things well-defined, uh, then anybody you talk to in the organization in those spaces will know the people and will offer them up. Um, I'll just start off with saying, uh, again, uh, that, that's part of the challenge is identifying the right people. And I know, Bob, with your <coughs> non of non data governance approach, a lot of that has to do with then one of those people to get what you need out of them without uh, really impacting them or taking them out of their day job. 
appreciate your saying that, and that that's exactly right. I mean, when we talked about who a steward was and what data stewards do um, in the last webinar, and it was a pretty hot topic. You know, the idea is that it's doing kind of exactly what you're doing is you're identifying the people who already know the data, or you're identifying the people who know the people who know the data, and you're you're having a good answer to the questions that they're going to have about, well, what does this mean to my job? So that's a, that's an extremely uh, important part, um, and thus you know, I think it was a good question to ask. So, um, thank you. anything else that you wanted to share on that, or can I move on to Gwen? Uh, we'll All right, so the same thing, and I know you've worked in a lot of different organizations, so you can probably share at least several. I know. We've only got a minute amount of time here, but um, share with us some examples of how the organizations that you've worked with and the organization that you're working with now identify who your stewards are and, and what work do. Mm -hmm. So um, the model that Dan described is very familiar to me, and it sounds like you're being very successful with it, Dan. Uh, what I've observed, however, are that there are four very distinct model for data governance. One is the I for Data Stewardship Association with Data Governance. This model is where the data stewards are those who touch the data. Uh, they have responsibilities for data activities. And so these people who who may be individual contributors in an organization or, or specialists in part of the data flow, when they're named stewards, their responsibilities are to articulate to ensure that certain standards and rules and um, controls are actually applied into the work. And so they may be responsible only for their span of work or for a group around them. So this model of, of, of lower-level stewardship, sometimes with a, a lower KS, I've seen that in organizations that are information factories where these people, the jobs may, may be uh, business analysts or information analysts. Now, at the other end of the extreme, I've been quite a few organizations where their stewards are are very, very senior people in the organization, and their responsibility is to do issue escalation, resolution, set direction, argue through the um, management aspects of a new governance rule, whose budget will it go through, um, resources will be used, what project are we going to piggyback over. So these are extremely senior people. Now, I actually got called in one place where they had um, assembled this sort of a group, and then they had handed out dictionary, terms from a dictionary to them and said, go off and, and uh, create some definitions for this. Obviously, the uh, um, the in those roles thought that that was not a good use of their time, and the program was troubled from the start because of that. Another model for stewardship, and that's the one that uh, is in place here at IFC, are our intermediaries. They are evangelists. They um, are embedded within the organization. And the goal is to um, visualize and communicate out to the organization uh, new standards or issues or, or concerns from a decentralized governance group and also to be eyes and ears on the ground of the governance group to collect issues and bring them back, as well as um, trying to spread the word about good governance and stewardship practices, the C1 help one model. And the model that I've seen, and this is, I've seen it many times. At first it surprised me, and then I finally got it. It is, uh, especially in large complex organizations, is to 
not even use the stewardship term. And when I saw it, I asked, what do you mean you're not having stewardship? They said, no, no, you got me wrong. We, we have stewardship responsibilities, but we're not naming anyone a data steward. And I said, why? I said, well, because we are so dispersed that we don't have time for the arguing over uh, status, uh, whether there would be a high-level or a low-level role. We don't have room for it. We're more concerned about the accountabilities, so we just assign data accountabilities. The next piece I heard this rationale that we named data stewards, it was because they had some history and the term had been reason for them. The next time I heard the rationale that we don't have data stewards, it was um, because of So many people came from organizations previously that, that used stewards in different roles. Some were top-level stewards, some were lower-level stewards, that they thought it would just add too much confusion. And then at a an extremely large, complex tip of the pyramid organization I was at, they um, tried to use the term because their governance was um, not down in the trenches touching the data, but it was serving more as a management alignment tool. And they to um, leave it to each line of business, uh, each different group, to um, uh, the terminology that made sense for them in their data management trench. So some of them may have used the term steward and, and some not. But because they were using this distributed model of governance, they uh, limited the confusion that might take place if one group in, on the West Coast had data stewards that were highly knowledgeable and influential deciders, where another group in the Midwest may have uh, data entry folks being designated data stewards. So um, my experience here is is that um, as soon as you start having a discussion with someone about their stewardship program or what they envision for you, for you, you should probably level set on which vision of stewardship is, is being discussed. How confusing, Bob. There. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me join. Okay. I'm Pablo. Thanks, Pablo. <laughs> yes, no problem. So in our organization, we probably follow what you represented when as the third model, okay? Our data stewards are mostly, or almost all of them, in the business units, okay? The church is a very large, complex organization. We have lots of uh, very independent departments. And so in, in our organization, there's something a little different that I haven't seen very often. I have seen it in some other uh, large government organizations or, or organizations that have this type of uh, silo environment. The main function of the data stewards in practice has been to control and authorize who has access to the data under their stewardship. Okay. We have a little process that we follow to identify the data stores. So, for example, as soon as we uh, identify a new domain of data that is not assigned to a particular data store, we talk with uh, several of the stakeholders in that department uh, around the people that normally use the information and try to, to identify who who would be the data steward? Who is the person that, that knows most about the data, that is always interested in the data, and so on? And then we interview several candidates, okay? Sometimes, most of the times, most people point directly to, to someone, all right, and they go there. And then we, we 
talk with those candidates. We see who would be best in, in their personality position. We like someone that is has some managerial or, or a director level position and then propose that assignment to the managing director of the department. Then we give them training on the different aspects of data stewardship, the use of sharing data, data quality, definition of data terms, and information security. And uh, um, then they go on and, and uh, start performing their work. Okay. That's what they do, what we do in our organization. Um, all right, guys. I had I had my uh, my phone on mute actually when she, when uh, Gwen came to an end, and uh, what I was going to say was you really supported the things that I I said in the webinar last month. It really depends on the organization. There's not just a single way to be able to identify who the stewards are or even what the stewards do within the organization. So I mean, and Gwen, I was concerned when I added you to the to the panel, not in a bad way, but in a good way, the fact that and I know that you bring a wealth of information about this and can share examples of um, what several organizations are doing that are doing. So to be able to provide four models was really a, a great answer. We just got to be careful because we're going to run out of time here. I know we're going to um, <laughs> we're going to have the, uh, the hour is going to be filled up before you know it. But again, I just want to tell people, if you've got questions for Dan, Gwen, and Pablo about stewards, if you can just send them in the Q&A section down at the bottom uh, bottom right of the screen, you know, we're going to hopefully, hopefully save some time at the end of the session, uh, so we're going to go through those questions. So again, I, I hope that that was helpful to all of you out there in, in listener land or in participant land, as far as uh, just hearing from different organizations, the options that, that you can have. And, and the idea is to pick the one that fits best into your organization, and I would think that uh, the, that the panelists would probably agree with that. Now, I know a couple of different people mentioned the, the the idea of metadata management, and I know Dan, it's something that's really near dear to Dan. Dan's going to answer this question third, however, but you know the idea, and I get questions all the time about the business glossary, about the data dictionary, about the metadata management. So we're going to start, Gwen, with you. If you could also, again, from your wealth of experience, about how you handle metadata that's associated with, uh, with, with the, the metadata that's associated with a governance program, and what metadata is that that uh, is associated with a governance program. I need to be a more brief <laughs> this time. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there's a core set. We all need to know who are stewards and um, sometimes referred to as business metadata, um, uh, what activities are undertaking. Interestingly, while it is considered business metadata, I consider it the master data of a governance program, who people and places and things and locations um, that we use to run our operations. Obviously, then there is um, technical metadata and um, data about the data, um, definitions and such. Uh, and there's legit data. So it is, you have a, a broad vision um, for what you can manage. And frankly, I have seen three one of those um, options put in play. I've seen them implemented in um, uh, metadata repositories. I've seen them most frequently managed through um, web portals uh, or cell spreadsheets. And I have not had the privilege of um, work an organization that uses one of the new governance tools yet, but I'm excited to hear from anyone who has because uh, it's, it's time that we cobbler's children get some proper shoes, I would say. I agree with you, and I'm kind of in the same boat as you are, Gwen, that I have, uh, there's several companies that have been looking at some of the newer tools on the market, and there's you know, certainly from a repository perspective, a lot of organizations, or at least some organizations, have pretty solid metadata programs. 
and uh, disagree with me if, if I'm wrong, but uh, I mean, in organizations, the type of metadata that you talked about, Gwen, is the data that relates to who to data mm -hmm. and who has mm -hmm. accountability, and I think that's where the industry is kind of going. Are you feeling the same way? I am. Okay. Uh, so who has accountability and another set um, that just came up in discussions today is to what level data survived and have we certified um, at a feed level, at a field level, and um, what does that certification mean? In a, do our responsible management reporting or financial reporting need to know exactly how well they can trust each and every data that goes feeds into their metrics. So that is one aspect of governance that they look at. They're looking at the governance of the data itself. The who aspects are are more about the, um, the people, the human side of data governance. And that's important, as we know, from getting the right people. You know, I talked about it in mm -hmm. other webinars to get the right people involved at the right time for the right reason to make the right decision. Most often leads to the right. Yeah, results. So with that in mind, um, let's move it over to Pablo. Pablo, I know we've talked about the artifacts and things that are being governed within uh, within the OES Church. Do you want to share with us what metadata you manage and how you go about managing it? Yes. Okay. So the answer to the question of how do we handle the metadata associated with data governance program, the answer is not very well. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sincere here. Frankly, one of the problems that we have is that, uh, you know how when mentioned that in some organizations, the data steward has a bad taste and a bad, bad rep, okay? In our organization, the word metadata has a bad, bad <laughs> rep, okay? And so it's, it's one word that I cannot use. Nevertheless, what we do is we, we are creating a data sharing portal where we have our uh, the glossary of terms and we have there the capability of storing a definition and I always try to to to, to say that this should be a not a database definition you know not what is in the comments uh, column of the database but actually a business definition and those are really really hard hard to come by, okay, it's, it's worse than trying to extract wisdom teeth from people to get a good definition out. Uh, um, we also have there the opportunity to classify the terms in terms of confidentiality and privacy, and also designate who is the data steward. So we group the, the business terms into domains and then assign this means to a department and a data store. So that is the metadata that we that we are governing, the the grouping of business terms into domains, assigning the business terms to a data store, classifying the business terms for confidentiality and uh, privacy, and then uh, trying to come up with good business definitions. And the other one is, is that last one. All right. If the other ones, the classification, it's also hard to actually many times commit people to make a decision, even if it's a simple decision, okay? But since uh, people are, are shy to to, to, to final decision on these things. Can you clarify what you mean by classification? Uh, are you talking about classification into domains? Are you talking about classification as far as highly confidential, sensitive? Public. Yes. So, so we have two classifications. One is the, the confidentiality classification, whether it's public, internal use, confidential or highly confidential data. Okay. And then the privacy classification, whether it's you know not privacy related, related or you know PII under regulation or very uh, high. Uh, sensitive on privacy. Okay. Where do you where do you store most of the metadata? So we have uh, this application that we are creating called a data sharing portal. 
Okay. And I think data sharing agreements is very big to the uh, LDS right. church's uh, solution, right? So this 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 uh, application it it, it does several things. The first one is to do to be the the glossary, you know, the data glossary for the organization. Okay, and that is where we do the metadata management and the classification of these terms, and then also helps us to control sharing of the data. Okay. I, well, I that, wish that, the, 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 the the definitions were easy easier to do, but in my experience, it, it has been so. If someone else knows how to do them better, oh. <laughs> <laughs> actually, that would probably be a really good topic for a webinar is how do we get business definitions out of business people? Let's yeah, put it uh -huh. in our uh, pocket and see if maybe that will be something that we'll, we'll address in the uh, in the future. Uh, because, Dan, because Dan, I want to do a quick, quick follow-up? It's not a big deal. Okay. Go ahead, Glenn. We just got to leave Dan some time. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, it's just that uh, as as Pablo said, that metadata is a, a a difficult word to say there. I've seen that a lot, as is documentation uh, or definitions writing. No strategic leader needs to spend money on those. But if you rebrand all of that work as transparency into our information, they all jump on board immediately. Because after good. all, metadata is just a tactic. Documentation is a tactic. The Korean dictionary is a tactic. Strictly, what they want is transparency. You know, now that I turn it over to Dan, Dan, were you tra did you how sell the governance uh, metadata into your organization? I know that you were using a couple of different tools. You're still using uh, some pretty well known tools. Um, was transparency part of how you sold the need for it, or, or how did you go about doing it? Yeah, well, you know, fortunately for me, um, I, you know, my my experience in trying to sell uh, the, the um, metadata governance and everything was all from my previous organizations. When I joined PNC five years ago, um, it was, uh, it, it was the, the people that were before me, the people that hired me, um, had already sold um, the executives on the need for data governance and metadata. So, you know, after um, a long time of trying to be the salesman, uh, it was clip because then I, I joined the data governance manager here responsible for data, and the sales job was already done. Now it was time to execute. <laughs> it was a whole different set of, uh, you know, a whole new challenge. And so that was in 2008. And, yeah, our, our first order of business in that sort of fledgling, you know, um, warehousing business intelligence group was select a metadata repository, and uh, we did. We uh, selected Informatica's metadata manager, which we'll use today for our technical metadata, and essentially point that tool to our Oracle databases, our uh, even our OBIE environment, etc. And um, we're using it for transparency, the the data lineage abilities to be able to trace, uh, you know, data from reports back to through the warehouse layers to their sources, etc. Um, and we, we still do that today. Um, we, um, we made a fundamental um, addition to that in 2010 uh, when we decided to get um, uh, more uh, mature on our business metadata. And so this is where we uh, bought and implemented a uh, business metadata repository or a business glossary. And that's what we uh, use adaptive for today. And we adapted. We have a, a business glossary where we've established the roles of data consumers that propose uh, terms and definitions um, into owning catalogs, which have data owners associated with them. Uh, owners assign those, those newly proposed terms out to data stewards, the subject matter experts. They, the data stewards then do kind of the heavy lifting on the definitions, um, get the, uh, the appropriate stakeholders around the organization, to weigh in on what these terms and definitions should look like um, back to the debt owner for final approval. Um, it, the, the tool uh, includes a workflow capability. So um, these are email notifications that go to the data owners and data stewards that um, you know this content has been proposed 
for their catalogs, et cetera. Uh, the part I'll say then, what we also did with that implementation uh, very soon after getting Adaptive up and running is we've linked the business metadata repository with the technical metadata repository. So you can get sort of a 360 degree view, you know, from a, a, a business term, which in some cases can be kind of a high level topic, you know, like, like a customer number um, or something like that. You can see that it has an enterprise definition. It has a, a enterprise data owner associated with it, and then you can actually um, look from that term into the technical metadata to see exactly what database fields are involved in delivering that data. And there you flip into the, the metadata manager world where you have, have all the stability and all the other tech metadata attributes associated with it. I know that you that metadata has always been a big part of the kind of the, the building block of which governance was uh, was rolled out. I'm trying to throw this this kind of follow up question out to the three of you quickly. And so why don't we start, Dan, with you? I mean, the certs and the people you identify as being involved in the governance activities. What's their responsibility for the metadata? Sorry, last part again. What's the response? What, what, what? Um, no, the the um, the kind of follow up question to that was, how do you involve the the stewards, or how are the stewards involved in the metadata management and keeping the tools up to date and active and approving things and such? Yeah, my my response on that is short, so I'll throw it out there. I mean, for us uh, again with our our business glory uh, application, it's um, it's the interface. It's you know, when data consumers, uh, and that's anybody throughout the organization, they compose those terms um, by selecting, you know, what data domain that term should belong to, at least we think. These are all notifications that show up, you know, in the data owner's inbox. So they work queue, they assign it out to data stewards. Again, my comments earlier, it's, it's just, it's very tactical. When we're adding, you know, new data owners and data stewards, we can be very, um, Direct as to what we're looking for from them, the content that they're responsible for, and then that, that it's a living repository. So, so that, you know, anybody can look at, it, you know, the, the set of terms in the risk catalog or in the finance catalog and see who's responsible for those, how many standing workflows there are, how many have been, you know, uh, been and approved, etc. Okay. All right. Yeah. And Pablo, I mean, I know you don't use the M word. <laughs> But how do you get the um, how do you get the stewards? How active are the stewards in managing the metadata as well? Oh, there. No pause on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. Me. Okay, there we go. Sorry. Yeah, that that has been a a problem for us actually. Um, you know, sometimes we can engage them. And um, one of the the, the, the trouble that we have is that if the people that know the, the the definition of the business terms, they they know it in their heads, okay, and they believe that that information is widespread, when in reality it is not, okay, or it is uh, shared uh, uh, in in the organization. But to get it out of people's heads into a written definition, that has been actually a big challenge. So I actually want to to see and to know uh, how to do that better. Anybody out there who has any suggestions? Maybe even Gwen can answer that. Gwen, just a, in, a, in a quick minute or so, um, maybe you respond to the relationship between the stewards and the metadata? Sure. Um, you know, it, it's... I'd be repeating what the other guy said, but what I'm hearing from here is that uh, it's evidence that most of our programs are still doing remedial work because if we were starting for new development or developing new data, then uh, at, at some point in a project, uh, the data is absolutely defined. It goes through this, this process. So we're we're trying to uh, deconstruct our data sets and, and retrofit 
definition. So I certainly uh, look forward to a period when we get caught up and we can move to better practices. Meanwhile, anyone out there who has tips for uh, extracting this information, that's that's highly valuable. Be able to let us all know. That would be great. And if you even send it to, to me in an email or to Shannon in an email, it'll get to me and we can you know, share tips like that in the uh, in the follow-up email. So thanks. I uh, I think that you know that that was those were great answers to the question. I got to move in on to the uh, the third and final question for this. Um, so the question is, we're going to start with Pablo, then we're going to go to Dan, and then Gwen. We're going to ask you to kind of wrap up this question. But Pablo, is, is master data something that's important to your program, or is your program important to master data? Um, are you using the term master data, um, and are you, um, you know, is there are there specific subject of master data that you have already governed? Yes. Yeah, so um, master data is actually extremely important in our program, and uh, master data has actually gained uh, in, in reputation because of that. Um, we develop an MDM uh, solution in-house that was uh, quite inexpensive, and the governance side, our team helped the master data program by uh, um, doing the marketing really with the data stores about the advantages of uh, putting information in an MDM repository. Okay. So over the years, we have uh, been able to put basically uh, different types of data sets. So the reference data sets that we have are languages. For us, the list of languages is extremely important because we translate materials in many languages and we have to keep track of uh, what is the, the content that is produced in the different materials. Geopolitical locations, all the list of countries, regions, localities, also that is uh, one data set that is extremely important and, and governed through the master data repository. Also, because we are an, a multinational organization, we have the list of currencies and exchange rates that are there in the, from the MDM. And then we, ha so those are the reference data sets. After the master data sets that uh, are more internal to, to the organization are all the organizations and the leaders of the organizations. For example, you know the the, the churches, the bishops, and who are the, the the leaders, ecclesiastical leaders of the church. All we have in the MDM and now the employees information, the reporting hierarchy. All the physical facilities, where are the churches, temples, seminaries, and and so on. So um, this information is now share these different data sets. We are sharing them with uh, over 95, 97 uh, different applications that receive feeds of the data uh, daily. And we deliver this information over 400 different endpoints. Okay? And the information is refreshed from the sources daily into all these other consumers. So that has been a, a big, big goal. The relationship between MDM and, and, and governance is really that we are kind of the, the, the main marketers of MDM both for the data stores that vision the data and for the requesters that receive the information. Okay. That's, um, you know, and, and the things that you described, I mean, that's exactly, first of all, the, the vast nature of your, your governance program and the different parts of the world that are infected and the, where you're getting data from uh, certainly went to the, the you as the best practice this award this year. So I, I, I like I like your answer. I think it was very helpful. Hopefully people got a lot out of it. Dan, I want to kind of switch over to you real quickly. Um, you know, are you, do you use the term master data? What does it mean to your organization? What's the relationship 
relationship between the master data and the uh, the data governance program. Sure, and I, I can probably get you some time back on this one, Bob. <laughs> uh, we, use, uh, we use the term master data. Um, we, um, although there have been a few attempts, we don't have a funded master data management program as of yet. Uh, there's been some time and energy spent in looking at uh, different solutions, you know, from, from like the IMs and informaticas and things like that. Um, we don't uh, we don't have an MB, MDM program today. Um, we do have, you know, in our uh, in our metadata world and our data governance world, um, you know, with a, a, along the lines of a, a master data, look at things like our product hierarchies um, and uh, you know, standing toward uh, an enterprise. Uh, product hierarchy where everybody can um, same understanding, the same uh, same levels and um, relationships among all of the products and things. Uh, if we're successful in doing that this year, I would consider that a, a step forward in, in this MDM space. But no uh, fully funded program today at PNC. Okay, and, then, and the, the truth is, in the organizations that I've worked with, some of them are doing master data management. Some of the organizations are doing master data management and not even calling it MDM, and they're they're not looking for specific tool sets to solve their problems for them. But what we are trying to do is, you see it everywhere, that data governance and the term master data are kind of connected at the hip. And wherever you hear data governance talked about, you also see MDM. Whenever you see MDM, you see data governance. Gwen, can you share with us uh, some of your experience uh, with different organizations real quickly about, um, you know, ones have seen governance focused on master data? Um, have you seen it be successful when it has not? You know, what, you know share your insights with us, please. Sure. Um, wherever the concept of master data management has been sold. Uh, there's a really good chance that you're going to also see governance in place because it is an acknowledged truth now, maybe not the first few years of master data management, that sustainable SES uh, requires governance. However, MDM is, is on sold into situations and environments um, that in which their data architectures are just not supporting the business. They um, have spaghetti code. They have embedded terms throughout their um, systems that are uh, uh, just create all kinds of problems. Found that often um, seen a master data management effort the way the the vendors would uh the tools might present it is the uh master data implement apps and, and in financial industry it's usually called reference data. Master data is just grouped into ref data as the broader term. Um correct me if, if you have a, a different perspective of that. Uh, but in in some environments, we have reference data as code sets and master data as being the values of our, our people, our places, our customers, et cetera. But uh, in three years especially, I've seen uh, an, a very interesting um, situation, and it's, it's one of the, the things that made this current job so attractive to me. Um, and that is uh, a, a slow coming to terms with the um, idea of master and reference data management as being the key to um, findability of information that uh, relates to um, business uh, competition, um, your effectiveness, your efficiency. That, those terms that may be labeled as reference data, the data values that might be labeled as master data are the very same terms that are used in queries uh, if we're doing search structured um, 
in search terms if we're looking it through web or unstructured content um, as tags that can apply to document management, content management, record management, nodes that end up in taxonomies or the facets uh, if we're using a, a faceted approach to search or um, new semantic technologies. They tend to be the values that are applied to the different levels of hierarchies or customer hierarchies. They're the terms that are used over and over and over again in uh, reports, their titles, their headings, the uh, key fields that appear in them. So the trend that I'm seeing now um, is to take a very broad, holistic approach to examining how these same sets of controlled vocabularies are applied across da traditional data management and governance and these other related fields. And uh, I'm just going to have a ball this year looking at strategy for how to um, pull all that together in a very large, complex organizations. Any of you that have already done this work in uh, maybe smaller organisms or less complex ones, please reach out to me. I would love to share stories, and but I think this is another topic for another discussion. I think it's a, it's a great topic for discussion, and um, it's really uh, it's really good to hear you talking as a practitioner and saying, hey, anybody done this before? Please let us know and uh, <laughs> you share your uh, share your ideas with us. I mean, that's one ideas of having this this type of a forum for a webinar is to get people talking about things, um, to get people to share ideas, and it's a great channel to be able to do that. So we've had a lot of people sign up for this webinar, a lot of people on the on the session right now that uh, hopefully they're getting a lot of good information out of it. And you know, me, uh, what I'll do is I'm going to hit on each of the uh, three panelists to see if they provide some insight to some of the other questions that we're going to get to. So we're going to let's start getting to some of the questions we have that have come from people uh, in attendance here. Uh, let's start with one. And I'm not sure how great I'm using the Q&A area because I'm getting like partial questions and things like that. But one that I can read, and it's not really related to the subjects of stewards and metadata and master data. Uh, I guess it's more related to the, the, the topic of governance in general. But um, let's uh, I'll start with Pablo. Pablo, do you feel that data governance is different when dealing with big data? Um, we have a lot of experience. So we are not getting too much into the big data realm yet. Um, and so they find, for example, a data stores for some of the what would be considered big data sets yet. Okay. We, we try to focus on those uh, data sets that are required or shared around the, the, the um, organization. And um, we are getting too much of that yet. But I, I suspect that the same principles that we develop and apply for data governance of the, the structured data would apply for what would be considered big data or content and structure data sets. If you are following a principles approach to, to, to governance, I think that it would be a very applicable. Okay, Ian, any experience with big data? Have you looked at big data, the relationship to governance? Yeah, honestly, I'm, I'm still waiting to see whether big data is just one of those uh, newer buzzwords to uh, a lot of books and products and things. Um, but <laughs> no, I know that there's more to it. Uh, I mean, massive. Um, the amounts of data that you know traditional database technologies have tried to manage. But I, I did respond to this question in the chat as well as some others. Um, to me, the, the principles and the purpose and the process, everything we're doing in data that in data governance, at least at PNC and, and what I hear from a lot of practitioners, you can apply all of that same stuff to big data uh, as well as any other data sets. I mean, you just uh, some of the nuances might be a little different as to 
the, your lineage or you know the the tools or your data tools for your big, big data sets. But uh, everything else to me is the same. It's all about data ownership, data stewardship, terminology, et cetera. Thank you, John. I mean, I'm, uh, I get the question fairly regularly if there is such a thing as big, da big data governance, and I'd say, yeah, there's data governance applied to big data. There's data governance applied to metadata. There's data governance applied to master data. It's still data governance, and yeah, you're right. There are nuances that you see. Gwen, any insight into that as to, you know, is there is anything different when it comes to governing big data? No, I, I like your answer totally. What I will say about nuances is that some governance activities are focused towards people and process and the organization. Some are focused upon actions taken upon the data itself and expectations for the data itself and the actions and controls to um, meet those expectations. When it comes to big data, you can send a question about uh, a, a data value to a council sitting around a room. Obviously, it doesn't work that way. So our focus is for big governance is on those expectations, standards, the application of business rules, those those control mechanisms that we place upon the data itself. That's our end objective. In order to do that, we also have to do the human side of of data governance to at least um, design the little g governance. Okay. Nothing. So I know, Gwen, you've written about big G governance and little g governance. Where do, where could people get information about that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Probably on the I data governance website, possibly. But oh, oh, yes, that's right. Datagovernance.com. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to that for you, uh, for Gwen. Right, one last question that I want to go through, and it's it's kind of interesting the way that it was asked. And in fact, it was it was asked kind of towards the end when we were talking about master data. It's just how do you even implement a data governance solution without master data? And I would kind of view that as maybe the other way around. How would you implement a master data solution without data governance? Um, let's throw it up to, to Pablo first. Pablo, any response to that? How would you implement a data governance solution without master data, or is it being asked backwards? Well, um, I really think that not, not very well. Okay, so uh, yeah, so they are they are really kind of two sides of of uh, the the coin. All right, the master data in my mind does kind of the technical integration, the the basically being able to pull the information that is most important to the organization together, and then governance. That's all the processes, the approvals, the, the soft part of actually making that master data available to the organization. Okay, so we, we work really close together in those things. Uh, we we have a, a quite a symbiotic relationship in the teams. Okay, you got a quick answer for that? We we're, we're running out of time here. I typed one in there. Um, you know, it depends on how you define master data. If it's if we're talking, if we loosely define it as sort of the the concept of having data domains, uh, you have to have those defined. You know, for a successful data governance program. I pointed out though, there's a lot of tools and processes and practices out under this label of uh, master data. We don't have those in our world today, and yet we have an active data governance program. Okay. Gwen, well, last comments on that. Comment on on Dan's. You may not have those tools, so you may not fit a vendor's uh, description of metadata management. But you certainly have master data, and you are managing it, and you are also governing it. So you're you're doing well. Bring that to my resume. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, to Dan Daly of PNC, Gwen Thomas. Of the IFC and Pablo Ribaldi of the LDS. Uh, it was a great webinar. We went through um, a whole bunch of different subjects, data stewards, to metadata, to master data. 
We had time for the Q&A. If we didn't get to the Q&A already, what we're going to do is um, we will include them in the follow-up email. Um, Gwen, um, Shannon, is there anything else that we need to touch on here? I mean, here's a list of when the upcoming webinars are at the, uh, for next month. Again, it's a special Wednesday date. And then the following month is really focused on governance for master data. Um, and I want to thank each of the panel members. I want to thank Shannon for her help, as always. And uh, thank each of you for attending. Hopefully, you know, provide some feedback to us. Let us know if this type of webinar was helpful to you. And perhaps we can provide something uh, similar to this in the future. Again, thank you very much for attending. Have a good day. Everyone, and thanks again to our panelists and Bob, of course, to you, and, and hope everyone has a great day. As mentioned, I will get a, the recording out, links to the recording, links to the slides, and as Bob mentioned, answers to questions we didn't get have a chance to get to, um, and make sure that we get that information to you by end of day on Monday. So keep an eye out for that, and that will come from me. So have a great day, and thanks again for attending and panelists thanks you again for participating this was a great discussion All right. mm -hmm. thank you